Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. I'm Tom Press, your host. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy, by Michael DeSemlian. And uh, yesterday and Tuesday, we were speaking about the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, Himmler, his Ignatius Loyola, and that it was a Vatican inspired crusade against the uh, the heretics the protestants the jews and the orthodox we'll continue our reading and discussion of that matter on page 195 of the book if you're following along remember the subtitle of this portion is entitled the third reich to be followed by the eu okay this this the third reich the second world war was just a a, a stepping stone to what we now see alive and well in Europe. That's the EU uniting Europe in a in a recreation of the old world order. A united Europe, a revived Roman Empire under the Roman Emperor, the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. The author continues in the first full paragraph on page 195. He said, The lesson and warning of history is that undemocratic regimes whose leaders owe allegiance to the Pope or practice, quote, the lofty principles of the papacy, unquote, pose a threat to individual liberty and carry out religious persecution. Now, I want to stop and comment here. The whole world seems preoccupied with this undemocratic regime called Islam and its leaders who follow the prophet Muhammad. The world is trembling at the thought of Sharia law, religious persecution, that individual liberties will be lost, that tyranny will reign. The whole world trembles at the prospect of an unreigned Islam in the world. But who seems to care at all about the history of an even bloodier, an even more ruthless, an even more undemocratic, and a longer-lasting regime than the papal regime? The author says the lesson and warning of history is that undemocratic regimes whose leaders owe allegiance to the Pope or practice, quote, the lofty principles of the papacy pose a threat to individual liberty and carry out religious persecution. For example, the Inquisition was alive and well in the Balkans in the 1940s. Now, I want to call my listeners' attention to how this author characterizes the Balkan Wars in the 1940s during the Second World War. He says, for example, the Inquisition, that is the Holy Roman Inquisition, was alive and well in the Balkans in the 1940s. Now, I know a little bit about the Balkan Wars of the 1940s and how the press literally covered up the papacy's torture and murder, and massacre, and burnings, and beheadings, and mutilation of the Orthodox Serbs of the former Yugoslavia in their attempt to create a modern Roman Catholic state called Croatia. It exists today. It is Roman Catholic by law. It is right across the channel eastward of, of Italy in the Balkan Peninsula. The former Yugoslavia, when it was beginning to crumble, was taken over by the Vatican. It was part of World War II. 
and it was Rome's persecution of the Orthodox. Remember, the Second World War was a wider inquisition, but we're talking specifically about that portion of the Second World War involving the Orthodox Serbs of the former Yugoslavia. Notice the author acknowledges that what took place in the Balkans in the 1940s was a Roman Catholic inquisition against the heretics. Remember, the Orthodox were that sect of Roman Catholicism that broke away because it rejected the primacy of the Pope. It rejected the primacy of the so-called successor of Peter. They rejected the quote-unquote Antichrist of the Bible. And, just as the Roman Catholic Church has persecuted true Bible-believing Christians for nearly 14 centuries. She wages war relentlessly against the Orthodox Serbs to try to force them to capitulate to Roman authority. It says, for example, the Inquisition was alive and well in the Balkans in the 1940s. Quote-unquote, convert or die was the choice on offer to 900,000 Orthodox Serbs in the, new st in the new state of Croatia run by Nazi puppet Antonin pa Pavlic and Roman Catholic primate Archbishop Elois Stepanak. Now, we've read uh, at least one book dealing with this subject here on Inquisition Update. We read it and commented on it in its entirety. Terror over Yugoslavia, written by Avro Manhattan. And I also have a copy of this book, Convert or Die, by, I believe, Edmund Paris. And it's on the docket here at Inquisition Update to be read and discussed. The Roman Catholic Church literally gave an ultimatum to the Orthodox in Serb, uh, Serbian Orthodox that li lived in the former Yugoslavia, convert to Roman Catholicism or die. And it was supported by the Nazi regime. It was led by the papacy and the Roman Catholic priests and friars called the Eustachi. Eustachi means Catholic action. And it was a modern-day crusade in the literal sense, a modern-day inquisition in the literal textbook definition. Now, Rome would have us all believe, as ignorant as we are, that the, the holy office of the inquisition is over. But here we have an example in the 1940s of atrocities equivalent to that that were demonstrated without shame and without apology for centuries, 605 years, by the papacy against non-Roman Catholics. We've got examples of the 1940s and even the 1980s and 90s. Rome never changes. She just put on, puts on different clothing. It says, for example, the Inquisition was alive and well in the Balkans in, in the 1940s. Convert or die was the choice on offer to 900,000 Orthodox Serbs in the new state of Croatia, run by Nazi puppet Antonin Pavlic, a Roman Catholic, and Roman Catholic primate Archbishop Elois Stepanak. Okay, we, we, these names are familiar to my listeners. Now it says 200,000 of these Orthodox Serbs were quote-unquote converted, that is, forcibly converted. They were given an ultimatum, convert or die. And so they converted to Roman Catholicism. 700,000 who preferred to die rather than to convert to Roman Catholicism, 700,000 Orthodox Serbs 
who chose to die rather than subject themselves to Roman Catholic authority were tortured, shot, burned, and buried alive. And I've seen pictures of all of it. Photographs of all of it. This appalling persecution carried out mainly by Eustachy priests and friars, that's Catholic action, Roman Catholic priests and friars, whose names are known, whose photographs are included with these atrocities, and published in books, they fought, quote, for the triumph of Christ and Croatia, unquote. What does the Bible say? When they kill you, they will think they're doing God's service. These Roman Catholic priests were killing in the name of Christ. Killing. Murdering. Massacring. Beheading. Plucking out the eyes. Slashing off the ears. Lacerating the lips of Orthodox Catholics. Removing their private parts and making ornaments of them. Plucking out their eyes and making necklaces out of them. Butchering them with machetes, cutting them up in innumerable pieces. That's what these Roman Catholic priests and friars did. And it's documented. It's undeniable. Photographs. News accounts, statements from the Vatican. And you know what? The world press deported these Eustachy priests and friars against the Orthodox Serbs. And I want to ask you, how can you trust a press that sides with the Antichrist and supports her killing? The author says this appalling persecution carried out mainly by Eustachy priests and friars, quote, for the triumph of Christ in Croatia, unquote, included many of the worst atrocities of the war. That is the Second World War. The whole thing was a Roman Catholic Inquisition. We're dealing specifically with the Croatian portion of the Second World War. And it says, certainly the mutilations were horrific, the savagery terrible. Now, there are many books written about this subject. I have several of them here at Inquisition Update. I've read and discussed one of them, and there are others that I will read and discuss here on Inquisition Update. The purpose of which will be to, to impress upon the minds of my listeners that Rome has never suspended the Inquisition. Whenever and wherever Rome has the opportunity and can get by with it without substantial damage to the Roman Catholic Church, she resorts to her ancient bloody traits. And never more were they, never were they more vividly demonstrated than what was done in the former Yugoslavia in order to create a Roman Catholic, a modern Roman Catholic state, Croatia. It's a Roman Catholic country by law. Anyone who's not Roman Catholic is persecuted to this very day. Now it says few people know what took place in Croatia during the Second World War. News of it has been simply suppressed. Nor do they understand what happened in the Balkans in the 1990s. Okay, this is under the Clinton administration. Persecution against the Orthodox Serbs was conducted by NATO at the behest of the American government who took its marching orders from the Vatican. So we have the, 
the unspeakable atrocities that were committed in the 1940s during the Second World War against these Orthodox Serbs. And it was simply revisited all over again in the 1990s under the Bill Clinton administration. Bill Clinton was Jesuit trained, had a Jesuit uh, university uh, education. He was also an alumni of, of, of Oxford, as I recall. He was a papist from the word go. He says the reestablishing of Croatia as an independent state during the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s is instructive. The European Union, led by Germany, ignored the protest of Great Britain and many other nations in pressing for this to happen. The Vatican was the first to recognize the reborn Croatia. Imagine that. Rome, the Vatican, was the first to recognize the creation of the modern Roman Catholic state of Croatia. And the press simply covered it up. It says, writing in September of 1991 in the Sunday Telegraph, historian Andrew Roberts expressed surprise that, quote, almost the entire Western media have chosen to champion the Croats. How are the Serbs expected to react to the decision to adopt the Eustachy's checkered symbol as the Croatian national flag? In Krajina, it takes longer than the attention span of CNN's, C, uh, of today's CNN broadcaster to forget the way the Franciscan friars participated in the slaughter of Serbs in Croatian Bosnia. Orthodox Serbs were promised protection if they converted to Roman Catholicism and were then killed after they'd entered their churches as the priests looked on. This is another account that we read of in Terror Over Yugoslavia by Avril Manhattan. That entire groups of Orthodox Serbs were given an opportunity to convert to Roman Catholicism. And so once they professed conversion to Roman Catholicism, then a Roman Catholic priest stood on a podium and, and baptized them all communally, splattering holy water all over him with his little dick and with a sponge on it. And then they were ushered into a church, this crowd of pitiless Orthodox Serbs were ushered into the church, and they set the church on fire and burned them all lest they convert back to orthodoxy. That's the horror of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the history of the Roman Catholic Church. She's never changed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever until Christ comes to destroy it. Don't look for reformation in the Roman Catholic Church. It is what it is until Christ comes to destroy it. And her atrocities are not over. And that's one of the reasons why Inquisition Update is named Inquisition Update. Orthodox Serbs were promised protection if they converted to Roman Catholicism and were then killed after they entered the churches as the priests looked on. None of this is surprising. Oh, by the way, that's the end of the quote. Remember, we were quoting from the Sunday Telegraph by historian Andrew Roberts. Those were his words. It was admitted by one member of the press, but it was ignored by the world press. This was all covered up with the cooperation of the world's press. It says, 
None of this is surprising if we know the history of, the Ro of Roman Catholicism. Quote, from the birth of popery in 600 A.D. to the present time, it has been estimated by careful and credible historians that more than 50 million of the human family have been slaughtered for the quote-unquote crime of heresy by popish persecutors, an average of more than 40,000 religious murders every year for the entire existence of popery, unquote. If you believe that only 50 million have been slain by the papacy in all those years, then you have to believe that at least 40,000, at least 40,000 per year had their blood shed by the Antichrist of Rome. Can the same be said of Islam? Oh yes, it's a bloody religion, no doubt about it. It's patterned right after the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic canon law and Sharia law are basically one and the same. No democracy, tyrannical regimes, religious persecution. Both, both religions have nuns. Both religions have monasteries. Both religions have monks. Both religions have a potentate. One's the Antichrist, the other the false prophet. And both reject Jesus Christ. Both of them. One says God has no son. That's Islam. And Roman Catholicism says the Pope is God hidden under a veil of flesh. It's just two sides of a diabolical coin. Heads I win, tails you lose. Tails I win, heads you lose. Choose one or the other. You've chosen Antichrist. And their histories prove of what spirit they are. But today the world trembles over Islam and fails to acknowledge the Inquisitor running the highest offices in your locality. The most powerful man in your locality is the local Roman Catholic bishop. He rules over your county courthouse. He rules over your city council. He rules over your school board. He rules over your library board. Don't worry about Islam. Get rid first of the elephant in the living room. Okay, the scripture speaks prophetically of the Roman Catholic Church's lust for power and blood. History has recorded many, not all, not by any stretch of the imagination has it recorded all, but many of the gruesome details. What does it say in the Bible, Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5? Come out of her, my people, and partake not of her sins, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Come out of her, my people. Do not be a partaker of her sins. Don't be a crusader in her wars. Because her wars and atrocities have not been forgotten or forgiven. They've been remembered. And they've reached unto heaven. Is that Islam or Roman Catholicism? It's Roman Catholicism. We've come upon the break. You're listening to the Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. For my part, I would take your prayers. I covet your prayers. Now, back to the book. I have another point to make. The author says none of this is surprising if we know the history of the Roman Catholicism. From the birth of popery in 600 A.D. to the present time, it has been estimated by careful and credible historians that more than 50 millions of the human family have been slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church for the crime of heresy by popish persecutors. An average of more than 40,000 religious murders every year and for the entire existence of popery, unquote. Now, let me tell you something. Fifty million is the number that is almost universally repeated. Fifty million. That's a lot of people. It's quoted ad nauseum. No matter what book you read, if the number is given, it's always given as 50 million. Doesn't anybody do their own independent research? Or do they just regurgitate numbers that Rome passes out? Let me explain something. If you believe, as I do, that the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, all the wars of the 20th century 
were Roman Catholic crusades against the heretics. Do you realize that those wars combined claimed more than 50 million just in the 20th century alone? How many people died under Stalin in Russia during the Second World War? Does anybody have an accurate number? That was a Roman crusade in Russia, too. And the same ones died. Protestants, Jews, and Orthodox. Russia was in cahoots with the Nazi regime. There had to be two opposing sides to justify the war. But who did the war consume? Protestants, Jews, and Orthodox. And who benefited the most from the First and Second World Wars? The Vatican. That's why we have an EU today. All that blood needed to be shed to get where the Vatican is today, the EU. This number needs to be abandoned. 50 million? You've got to be kidding me. 50 million is just a drop in an ocean of bloodshed that Rome has claimed since her beginnings in 600 A.D., only God knows the correct number, but it's not 50 million. Far more, far, far more than 50 million. The lives that were lost in the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Balkan Wars, it all took place during the 20th century, just 100 years and the number of lives lost in those wars collectively combined exceed 50 million. Just in a hundred years. The Roman Catholic Church has been killing since 600 A.D. I think you ought to be ashamed if you regurgitate this number anymore. It's ignorance. Credible historians? Common sense dictates that this number has been dwarfed. Again, he says, from the birth of Popery in 600 A.D. to the present time, it has been estimated by careful and credible, I, I just have to add the word, Catholic historians, that more than 50 million people of the human family have been slaughtered for the crime of heresy by popish persecutors, an average of more than 40,000 religious murders for a year for every existence of the papacy. Now, Tom, you've gone over the top, haven't you? You say all the historians are wrong, all the authors are wrong, and you're the only one that's right. I'm simply saying 50 million has been regurgitated. It was once published in the Spanish Inquisition that were, it claimed the lives of 50 million, and we just... We just get in the habit of regurgitating the same number all over and over and over again. And it excludes the, the, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Balkan Wars, all of them. Every regional conflict, it's all been ignored. We just keep regurgitating this 50 million number as if that's... All there is to Roman Catholicism. Why, they only claim 50 million. The number is staggering. God knows what it is. And when he rewinds the tape for us to show us these atrocities, the ones that he has not forgiven, the ones that he has remembered, we're going to know about. And trust me, when we get there, you'll remember what I said. 
50 million isn't even a drop in the bucket. The, the Bible, the scriptures speak prophetic, prophetically of her lust for power and blood. She's dripping with blood. She's drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, says the Bible. She's guilty of the blood of the saints and the prophets and all the slain of the earth. Fifty million? The scriptures speak prophetically of her lust for power and blood. History has recorded many, not all, I will add, of the gruesome details. The gruesome details are going to be seen by the saints. No longer will the slaughters of the Roman Catholic Church be secret to anyone. They're secret now. They're guarded by the world press. But God sees in the dark. And we're going to know all. And judgment is going to be given to the saints. You and me. That's right. That's what the Scripture says. Now, you can't render judgment un until or unless you've seen the facts. You can't render righteous judgment unless or until you have seen the facts. Fifty million, my eye. Now, the papacy has been predominant throughout the whole history of Europe. It has left its mark and record on most of the major nations of Europe. In times past, it has proven itself to be totally dominant in its control of the kings and the princes of Europe. The whole history of the Western world for 14 centuries has been plagued by the intrigues and the machinations of the Roman Catholic Church in unceasing pursuit of her global designs. You still worried about Islam? In the words of historian James A. Wiley, quote, as regards the influence of popery on government, it were easy to demonstrate that the papacy delayed the advent of representative and constitutional government for 13 centuries. What was there before constitutional and representative government? Papal tyranny. He says, as regards the influence of popery on government, it were easy to demonstrate that the papacy delayed the advent of representative and constitutional government for 13 centuries. Superstition is the mother of despotism. Christianity is the parent of liberty. There's no truth which the past history of the world more abundantly establishes than this. It was through Christianity, that is, Protestantism, true Bible-believing Christianity, it was through Christianity that the democratic element first came into the world. The papal government is the very antipodes of constitutional government. It centers all power in one man. It does so on the ground of divine right and is therefore essentially and eternally antagonistic to the constitutional element. Let me tell you, I will add to his words, antagonistic, eternally antagonistic to the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. James A. Wiley continues, its long dominancy in Europe formed the grand barrier to the progress of the popular element in society and to the erection of constitutional government in the world. Unquote. Did you understand what James A. Wiley just said? Were it not for the Protestant Reformation, there would have 
never been such a thing in the world as a democratic government. There never would have been anything in the world such as a constitutional government. There never would have been anything in the world like a bill of rights. There never would have been anything in the world like freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to keep and bear arms. There never would have been freedom to worship Christ and Him alone. That's a truth of history. Because the old world order was papal tyranny. You survived at the behest of the papacy, and when you came out of favor with the papacy, you were killed by the civil powers that ruled under the authority of the Pope by divine right. Now let me tell you what none of the press, none of the world press will tell you. The new world order is simply the reestablishment of that old world order post-Protestantism. Since Protestantism has given up the ghost and no longer protests the Antichrist of Rome and yet believes on a future fiction, they have exonerated the papacy and now the world's governments are in cahoots to restore that old regime so that they can rule by divine right and not be challenged. They want rule by the volition of a single man, the Pope of Rome. And they want him to seat upon their heads their crowns and put, upon their hand, put in their hands their censers and their crucifixes. And they're going to rule over us like no other time in history. You see the consequence? You're beginning to see the consequence of believing the lie called futurism? You see the consequences of exonerating the papacy, of its true identity, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist of the Bible, the little horn of Daniel. Do you see the incalculable consequences of such a grave error in understanding? Do you see the consequences of the grave error called ecumenism? You believe in futurism, you believe in papal tyranny all over again. Now the author under the subtitle Our Hope and Prayer for Europe says, once again we've come to a defining moment in history. Once more the Vatican is engaged in placing its hallmark and its rituals on the face of Europe to further its familiar agenda. It does so in a number of different ways directed from the highest levels of command at the Vatican. Firstly, it operates directly through its civil ambassadors in each European nation. According to the Catholic Almanac, quote, papal rep representatives received from the Roman pontiff the charge of representing him in a fixed way in the various nations or regions of the world." Unquote. Secondly, the Roman Catholic Church also deals directly and legally with individual nations, that is, through the law, man's law, Roman Catholic canon law. That's where we get the term legally. It's unlawful, but legal, if you understand what I'm saying. That secondly, the Roman Catholic Church also deals directly and legally with individual nations through its many legal concordats. Less directly, it operates through its representation and influence in most of the governmental agencies of Europe. This involvement, especially in the area of finance and business, is documented in her almanac 
under the heading of governmental organizations. These include the United Nations, the Council of Europe, the Organization of American States, the International Organization for the Unification of Private Law, and the International Council on Grain, among others. Starting to ring shades of Revelation chapter 18 all over again. Rome has her observers and delegates in all of these listed organizations. Now let me ask my listeners a question. For what purpose do all of these organizations exist if Rome has her representatives in every one of them? Rome has her overseers in every one of them. They're there to serve the Vatican. They're there to implement this new world order, the recreation of the old world order. None of these institutions would exist if, it were, if they were not charged with reinstituting the papacy as the global supreme ruling authority. Again, it says Rome has her observers and delegates in all of these many listed organizations. Finally, she operates through her own people in Europe whose allegiance is first and foremost the Roman Catholic Church. This is exactly why no Roman Catholic should serve in any public office. No position of power or authority should ever be occupied by a Roman Catholic because their first allegiance even though they're standing in the, in the stadium with you with their hand on their heart, swearing allegiance to the United States, their first allegiance is to their vicar of Christ in Rome. And their obligation, it's, a, it's become a salvific issue, according to the Roman Catholic Church, that every Roman Catholic use whatever influence it has in its, in its locality, in its society, to make America and Europe Catholic. Okay? The only good Catholic is one who seeks high office, power and authority, and uses that power and authority to inch by inch, little by little, convert the world to Roman Catholicism. And if outward conversion to Roman Catholicism isn't in the offing, than to make the civil laws of the land Roman Catholic and force the people under pain of prosecution to be Roman Catholic without their knowledge, without their consent, without their support. It says, finally, she operates through her own people in Europe whose allegiance is first and foremost to the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, you you worried about Islam immigrating to this country? Converting us to Sharia law? Instituting the caliphate? What about the elephant in the living room? What about the Roman destroyer in the living room? What about the man of sin? The son of perdition? The little horn spoken of by the prophet Daniel. What about the Roman beast in the living room? It says many of her people, Roman Catholic people, have access to positions in the ruling structure of their nation. As Roman Catholics, they are enjoined by the Vatican to use both influence and position to bring that nation into line with papal policy on any particular issue. Is this not consistent with everything else we've read? The many, many, many books that we've read and discussed here on Inquisition Update? How could so many witnesses be wrong? We need to pray that Europe will not be taken back 
to the state that it was in spiritually and politically during the Middle Ages when the Pope ruled supreme over the kings of the earth by her laws and ceremonies, that is, by Roman Catholic canon law and the sacraments and ceremonies of the Roman Catholic Church, by her bishops, priests, and laity are obliged to accept the system that recognizes the papacy, the Pope, as the universal, quote-unquote, sovereign father while denying the true Father and the Son. From its traditions, from its history, and from its crises, it is evident that it is an institution lacking the gospel of grace in Christ, one that walks in darkness and in the shadow of death. In contrast, the true Christian faith may outwardly look small and weak, but inwardly and in essence, it is the strongest power on earth. That same power liberated most, if not all of Europe, at the time of the Reformation. Even Roman Catholic countries in Europe demanded constitutional republics. They overthrew the papal temporal power. The Protestant Reformation liberated nearly all of Europe. Are they going back to Rome? Because the papacy has been exonerated of the onus of Antichrist by the Jesuit lie, the greatest lie told since the Garden of Eden, the lie called futurism. The world is deceived. Even the very elect, they have to repent of ecumenism, of futurism, and return to biblical Christianity. Or else, I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.